Welcome back to the Timmer Podcast. My name is James, and I'll be your companion as you and I investigate the character, conquests, and legacy of the infamous man, Timmer the Lame. A man who arose in the mid-14th century and carved out for himself a vast empire in Central Asia. And our goal for this journey is to understand who Timmer was, what did he do, why did he do it, and why does it even matter? So, when we last left off, we were inching our way closer and closer to Timur's arrival onto the stage of history. The first episode, we looked at Genghis Khan and the the kind of creation of the Mongol Empire. Last week, we heard all about Ogadai, the second great Khan, and a lot of the important things he did. But then, as people tend to do sometimes, he died. Europe was on the run and open for conquest. The Mongols had a firm foothold in the Middle East. The campaigns in China were going pretty well. And then most of that just came to the screeching halt because Ogadai was dead. And the Mongols, like everybody else, weren't too sure what would happen next. As for Ogadai, he died on December 11th, 1241, around the age of 55 or 56. And if you'll remember, Ogadai was a heavy, heavy drinker. A total alcoholic, despite the warnings that his family and friends had given him. And it was the morning after one of these drunken nights that Ogadai suddenly worsened in health and then died. Many of the Mongolian people blamed his political enemies or even some of his own family members for things like witchcraft or poisoning of the Great Khan. But these rumors were eventually put to rest because, well, all the aristocrats at least knew that it was the drinking that had killed Ogadai. But the big question is, who comes next? If you remember back to when Genghis Khan died, his youngest son from his favorite wife, Tolui, or or Tolo, ruled for a few years as kind of a a steward of the throne or protector of the realm until all the Mongolian leaders could be gathered at an assembly, a a quarrel tie, to elect Ogadai Khan. And again, elections here were just mostly a tradition because Genghis had explicitly said Ogadai would be his rightful heir, and who the hell is going to go against the Great Khan's word, even if he is dead? But the point being that there was this section of time in between Genghis's death and Ogadai being given the title of Great Khan in which a different family member, Tolui, watched over things as preparations were made to uh, hand the throne over to Ogadai. And this was a system put in place so that the realm would always have that core leadership it needed until the next Great Khan would be elected. So after Ogadai's death in 1241, a very similar thing happens. The regency immediately transfers over to kind of that caretaker of the realm. And in this case, it goes to Ogadai's widow, a woman named Torigen. Now, Torigen was originally either from the Naaman or the Merkit tribe. And scholars go back and forth on this, but regardless, she was living with the Merkit people during Genghis's conquest of them. And this had happened so many years earlier, in the year 1204, and in that year, Torigen's people were conquered, and she was taken and given as a wife to Genghis's third son, Ogadai. Now, the Mongolian elites were all big into polygamy, and Ogadai already had a wife at this point, and he'd pick up several others as the decades progressed, but Torigen was different from all the other women. From the beginning, really, she mastered the political game. And very quickly, she was known far and wide as the most important and powerful wife of Ogadai. What also helped her situation is that Ogadai's first wife was unable to give him any sons, and Torigen was able to give him five sons. And you and I both know how important that would have been, how that would have appeared in a society where boys were almost always preferred to girls. As messed up as that sounds to us today, that's how it was. And if a woman can give her husband five sons, well, that's a pretty good thing. But as powerful and as motivated and as blessed with sons as Torigen was, her relationship to her husband Ogadai actually wasn't all that great. If she disagreed with the decision that he made, then you can bet that she told him. She had her idea of how to run the empire and her drunken husband was screwing so much of it up. But besides his constant drinking, Torigen also saw another culprit, and that was Ogadai's advisors. Now, these were learned men from all the corners of the Mongolian Empire, and more often than not, Torigen disagreed with them and even hated them. Now, I don't want to paint Torigen as some sort of hateful brat who was always complaining, because she was anything but that. She was a political mastermind, and what she wanted was for her family, the family of Ogadai, but more importantly, her own sons, to rule the empire long after her husband's death. And nobody is going to stand in her way of achieving this. Except maybe Ogadai himself, 
sort of. Because Ogadai had already chosen who his heir would be, and he had chosen his son Kuchu, who he had with a different wife, not Torijin. And as expected, she did not accept this. Thankfully for her, though, Kuchu was actually killed in 1236 while fighting the Song in China. So maybe now Torijin could convince her husband to choose one of her boys to be heir. Well, oddly enough, Ogadai didn't do this. He instead chose the son of Kuchu, Shermon, that is, his grandson, instead of choosing one of his other sons with Torijin. Now, there are a few theories as to why he chose a grandson over a different son, and you can imagine all the family intrigue that went into this, but long story short, as expected, Torijin is furious with this decision. To her, this is a slap in the face to her and her sons, and it means that her family will end up being some forgotten appendage to the Mongolian throne rather than the ruling family. So throughout much of Ogadai's reign, Torijin was there begging with him, debating with him, reasoning with him to choose a son he had with her instead of a grandson he had through a different wife. And the son she wanted in particular to be the next great Khan was a, na a man named Guyuk, who, if we're being honest, was really your ideal Mongol leader. He was a strong warrior, he had led several campaigns, he had allies both in the military and the aristocracy, and like his mother, he was politically brilliant. He knew how to play those games and how to survive, and he wanted his family to be the ruling family. But no matter what Torijin did, Ogadai refused to name Guyuk as his heir. The heir was going to be Ogadai's grandson, Shermon. And then, near the end of 1241, Ogadai died. The world saw his death as a, a brief break from these Mongolian conquests. The Mongol people saw his death as a tragedy that came too soon because of his heavy drinking. And Torijin, behind her veil of sorrow for her late husband, saw this as the opportunity she needed. Now, the interesting thing about what happens next is that, well, Torijin pretty much immediately becomes the ruler of the Mongol Empire. Wait, what? I isn't that what she wants? Well, sort of. You, you see, she was not the great Khan, but Mongolian law dictated that if a Khan should die, his wife should become the queen regent over the realm until the next Khan is elected. And Torijin, being the most powerful of Ogidai's wives, quickly built up enough support for her to gain this title. But this doesn't mean that she has what she wants yet. First of all, this title is temporary and everybody knows it. She only has the title of Queen Regent until the next Khan is chosen. And secondly, everybody knows that Ogadai chose his grandson rather than one of her sons. But you and I know Torijin, and we know that she's not going to settle for this. She is going to get her boy, Guyak, and I, I keep calling him a boy. He's a full-grown man, but he's her boy, and she's going to do anything and everything to get him into power and make her family the family of the Mongolian throne. So what does she do as queen regent? Well, the better question is, what does she not do? Well, the first thing she does is she fires, imprisons, or chases out most of Ogadai's advisors and governors, especially the ones who disagreed with her. And she then replaced them with men who were loyal to her and her family. Now, the upside of this is that her support was growing, and it was growing fast. The downside is that, well, a lot of Ogadai's advisors had been really good advisors and administrators. And so there were areas of the empire that really started to struggle under her new leadership that she had put in place. But in her mind, this was a necessary step, and, well, she was mostly right, as we'll come to see. And it's at this point that we have to take a pause to introduce another woman to the scene. She was a Persian and actually a Muslim woman named Fatima. And Fatima was almost certainly a captive taken during the Mongol invasion of the Khwarezmian Empire so many decades earlier. She was probably taken as a slave, and then eventually somehow made it into the ownership of Torijin. And Fatima was just as intelligent and as strategic as Torijin, so the two became quick and inseparable friends. Maybe even lovers, although it's impossible to know that for certain. Either way, regardless, Fatima became Torijin's chief advisor and political ally. And in most cases of secrecy, Fatima was the only person who Torijin trusted. So centralizing government with her supporters and centralizing advising with Fatima was really the first thing that Torijin did. Secondly, uh, again, Torijin knows how the empire works, and she knows that if the soldiers and the different aristocrats are off fighting, it'll be less likely that people will be around to challenge her. 
So she orders and directs the continuation of the war in China against the Song. And remember, that just goes on for decades. But eventually, with her direction, the Song sue for a ceasefire. They haven't been conquered yet, but this was an important Mongolian victory nonetheless. Also, remember that the Mongols have a firm presence in the Middle East at this point, and a lot of the other powerhouses there are really starting to get worried about that. In the year 1243, an alliance that crossed religious and ethnic lines, interestingly enough, was created to sort of check the Mongols and throw off their chains of subjugation. The Turkic Sultanate of Rum in Anatolia, the Greek or Roman Empire of Trebizond in northern Anatolia, some Armenians, some Georgians, and even some European crusaders, they united to basically tell the Mongols, we're not going to take any more of your abusive rule in this area. Well, we all know what happens next. Despite this alliance including both Europeans and Turks, Christians and Muslims, the Mongols were just too powerful. And they crushed this alliance in battle, and these powers were forced once again to submit to the Mongols. So, Torijin is actually, well, she's doing it. She's keeping the empire afloat, and not only that, she's continuing to expand it. She's building up her power base and electing advisors that are loyal to her. But remember, there has to be a curl tie at some point, that Mongolian assembly where all the leaders of the empire will elect the next Khan, and she knows that they're not going to elect her son, Guyak. They're going to elect, well, Ogadai's grandson, who is not her son. So what is she going to do about this? The Kuraltai, the Mongol assembly, means that her political enemies will elect the grandson of Ogadai, who he chose, which means that she will have lost, with Guyak, her son, not sitting on the throne. Well, she postpones the Kuraltai, and then she keeps postponing it, all the while continuing to build up support for her family, especially her son Guyak. And she does this for several years, continuing to postpone the curl tie for all sorts of excuses, but just doing anything to buy herself more time. But the Mongols didn't just roll over and take this. She had a whole host of pol political enemies. At one point, the entire empire almost crumbles into civil war as a brother of none other than Genghis Khan marches into Mongolia with an army with no doubt an intention to remove Torijin from power. And right at the moment where all hope seems lost to her, her son Guyuk arrives with an army of his own to protect his mother. And no battle was fought, thankfully, and the empire remained intact. So Torijin took power in the year 1242, and four years later, by 1246, she felt that she had enough power and support to finally hold that curl tie and get her son Guyuk elected as the third great Khan of the empire. However... There was a small problem with this plan, as there always is. Well, there was this important man who stood in her way. This was a man by the name of Batu or Bat. And to understand who Batu is, let's zoom out for a moment back to Genghis Khan and his four favorite sons. Genghis's oldest son was Jochi, and one of Jochi's sons is this new character, Batu or Bat. And so Batu is the grandson of Genghis Khan through Genghis's oldest favorite son, Jochi. And Batu has actually been a rather large character in this entire story, but for the sake of simplicity, I have left him out until until now, where he really starts to get super important. But anyway, Genghis's eldest son, Jochi, is dead, leaving Batu as really the male leader of that family line, that is, the line of Jochi. Now, Genghis's second son, Jagatai, of course, had his own family, and they were doing their own thing. Genghis' third son, Ogadai, was of course the second great Khan, and it was now one of Ogadai's wives, Torijin, who was queen regent of the empire and working to have her son, Guyuk, elected as the third great Khan. And finally, the youngest son, Tolui, or Tolo, who had his own line of descendants who will become important a little on down the road. Anyway, I know this gets super confusing really fast, but if you can remember the four sons of Genghis Khan and the families of each of these sons, then things make a lot more sense. Each family wanted to do everything they could in their power to gather as much power for themselves. These four families notoriously hated each other most of the time and rarely worked together because of these rivalries. So Torijin of the Ogadai family wants the Ogadai family to keep control, and more specifically she wants her own son Guyuk to be the next great Khan. And Batu, the leader of the family of Jochi, had had enough of this Ogadai leadership and he wanted a different family, probably his own, to gain the position of the great Khan. 
Now, Joji's territories and troops were stationed in what we would call Russia today, far, far away from the heartland of Mongolia and the empire. And he also didn't really have the right to elect himself as the next Khan. After all, Ogadai had made it quite clear that the power was going to stay within the Ogadai family. So what does Batu do? Well, he refuses to attend the curl tie that Torjan sets up to elect Gayuk. Batu doesn't openly rebel, but he gives every excuse to stay in Russia rather than travel back to Mongolia for the curl tie. You know, you've heard it all. Sorry, I left the oven on. Sorry, I'm, I'm conquering the Rus, gotta keep that going. Sorry, I'm, I'm just really sick and can't travel. That's what he does to basically keep from going to Torijin's curl tie. And Torijin becomes a little worried about this, but nevertheless, she holds the curl tie anyway in the year 1246. And this was no small event. It was part celebration, part election, part grand display of wealth, and part making sure that all the different sections of your empire were still loyal. And it lasted for weeks. Among the attendees were rulers and diplomats from all corners of the world, including administrators and rulers from Persia, two Georgian men both named David and both claiming to be the rightful kings of Georgia, the Russian Grand Duke Yaroslav, the king of Armenian Cilicia, the future sultan of the Sultanate of Rum, envoys from the Caliphate of Baghdad, even messengers from the Pope all the way in Rome came to this curl tie. This curl tie was the political hub of the entire world, with men bowing and submitting to Torijin, who had nearly achieved what she had worked so hard to get all these years, supreme rule of the Mongolian Empire by her family. And because of all the support she had built up and all the work she had put into this, her son Guyuk was elected as the third great Khan of the Mongolian Empire on August 24, 1246. Guyuk accepted the Khanship on the condition that from here on out, the line of the Great Khan should be passed down through the Ogadai family, meaning that Torijin's goal was finally completed. The throne was in her family to stay. And so this leads us to the third Great Khan, Guyuk. So let's talk about him. I already said that he was really the perfect guy for the job. He was a respected soldier, and then like his mother, he was intelligent, and like his father Ogadai, Guyuk was militarily ambitious, and he saw all of Europe as the obvious next choice for Mongolian conquest. Because remember, Ogadai had really started the invasions of Russia and Poland and Hungary, and Guyuk saw Europe as the next best place to basically take over. And actually, during the Quirrell tie where he was elected, there was a messenger sent from the Pope in Rome with the message of basically, hey, please stop attacking Christian people. And Guyuk's response to this is just chilling. Guyuk responds to the Pope with, you must say with a sincere heart, we will be your subjects. We will give you our strength. You must in person come with your kings all together without exemption to render us service and pay us homage. And only then will we acknowledge your submission. And if you do not follow the order of God and go against our orders, we will know you as our enemy. So Guyak wants war with Christian Europe. But first, there's this little problem that Guyak has to deal with, and that is his mother, Torijin. Why? Why does Guyuk have a problem with his mom, the person who put him into this power in the first place? Well, maybe it's because of exactly that. Guyuk knew that he wasn't really the ruler. He wasn't the most powerful member of Ogadai's family. His mother was. And so pretty much right away, Guyuk checks his mother's power by removing advisors that she had put in place and restoring a lot of the administrators and advisors that his father Ogadai had employed and whom Torijin had removed. And of course, because of this, Torijin is furious by this act, but things are okay for her. Because remember that Torijin's friend and ally, Fatima, was still one of the most influential people in the empire. And as long as both Torijin and Fatima remained, Guyuk knew that he wouldn't really be the ruler of the Mongol Empire. So as Guyuk in this position, what do you do? You can't go after your mom, obviously, no matter how much you hate her, because after all, she was the queen regent and the wife of Ogadai. But you can go after Fatima, because first of all, she's a Persian, an outsider, and secondly, she's Muslim, and most of the people living in the Mongol Empire, at least Mongolia, were pagan. 
And although the Mongols were generally religiously tolerant, many of them didn't like seeing a Muslim so high up on the food chain. So what happens next is, well, okay, I'll, I'll just tell you what happens, and then we can ponder the possible conspiracies behind it. Because we know what happens, we don't really know why, though. Here's what happens. Gulyak has a brother, a guy by the name of Kodin. And Kodin is really, really sick. He's, he's dying. And so Kodin declares that Fatima is a Muslim witch who is poisoning him with some sort of spell. Well, Fatima and Torjin, of course, deny this, but Guyuk steps in and demands that Fatima lift her spell. Then, unfortunately, his brother Coden dies, and the people begin to hate Fatima for this. She's a witch, she's out to kill the royal family, blah blah blah, you know the drill. And so Guyuk uses this and demands his mom, Torjin, hand over Fatima for punishment and death. Well, Torjin refuses to hand over her friend and advisor, so Guyuk sends soldiers to seize her, which they do, and Torjin then tells Guyuk that if you kill Fatima, I will commit suicide. And what that means is that it would, that would cause so many problems, and it would especially give Guyuk's political enemies a ton of good fodder to use against him. You know, he caused his own mother to kill herself and things like that. Well, Guyuk knows what must be done for him to really be the, the sole ruler, so he executes Fatima, and he does it in a pretty horrific way. Every orifice in Fatima's body is sewn shut while she's alive, and then she's thrown into a river to drown. The next part of the story is that 18 months or so after this happens, Torigen dies. Now, we don't know how she dies. Was it suicide? Maybe. Was it poisoned by her own son? Maybe. Was it old age? We don't know. There's no decisive answer. So, as you can see, this story is just waiting for conspiracy theories to pop up. And of course, they, they have. Did Guyuk, did he organize this entire thing to frame Fatima to kill her and then use that to get at his mom? Was this whole thing actually true? Who knows? And unfortunately, we probably will never know the true answer as to why events played out the way they did. But we do know what happens next, and that is that Guyuk was without a doubt the guy really in charge of the Empire. He's appointing his own advisors, he's pursuing corrupt officials and, and punishing them, he's making plans to invade Europe. I, I mean, he'd already demanded that the Pope and all of the Christian kings come to Mongolia and submit. And at the same time, he's also planning the continuation of the conquest of the Middle East. The two states in the Middle East that bordered the Mongol Empire and were still not fully under control were the Assassins, yes, that's, that's right, they were called the Assassins, and the Abbasid Caliphate, centered around Baghdad. And we'll get into both of these powers a little later, but for now, Guyuk sends, he sends them word demanding that they bend the knee. But there is still a big problem that Goyuk has to take care of, and that is that dude Batu over there in Russia. Do you remember him? Yeah. So, well, hey, Batu, why did you not attend my curl tie, huh? Do you, do you have something against me? And Batu responds, no, 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 of course not. Well, okay, then how about you come here to Mongolia to officially and publicly declare your allegiance to me, okay? We'll, we'll settle the score once and for all. So now that Guyuk is personally demanding that Batu come to Mongolia and bend the knee, well, Batu really has no choice. So he packs his bags and begins that long journey from Russia back to Mongolia. And he's got his backpack, his roadmap, and an entire freaking army of very loyal and experienced troops. So that's kind of a big red flag, and when Guyuk hears about this, he immediately gets together his own army and begins marching west in the spring of 1248. Finally, after all Genghis and Ogadai had done to prevent a tragic civil war, finally there is a civil war, with Batu and Gayak quickly marching towards one another with whole hosts of warriors. Anyway, while marching west through China, Gayak suddenly dies. The third great Khan of the Mongol Empire died on April 20th, 1248, aged only about 42. Goyuk almost certainly died because, guess what, just like his father and his uncle, Goyuk was a crazy alcoholic. And now he was dead after only ruling for two years, from 1246 through 1248. Now, as was custom, again, the Great Khan's wife took over as queen regent until a new Great Khan could be elected, and Goyuk's wife, Ugol Hamish, was declared queen. 
and Hamish got along well enough with her late husband's advisors, but she lacked the brilliance and the political know-how that her mother-in-law, Torrigen, had possessed. For example, during her regency, 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 King Louis IX of France was crusading throughout Egypt in what we now call the Seventh Crusade. And King Louis sent a diplomat to the leaders of the Mongols proposing this grand alliance between France and the Christian Crusaders and the Mongols, with the aim being that the Christians coming in from the West and the Mongols coming from the East would create, well, it would smash the Muslims in between them. Because, well, both of them were fighting the Muslims, so why not work together? It's really not a bad plan. But Hamish responded with the blunt message of, Submit to us! Meaning that there was no hope for this alliance, at least at this point. And again, this alliance probably would have benefited both the Mongols and the Christians, but Hamish said no. Not only that, but she said submit to us, just to further alienate her Christian potential allies. Anyway, as for King Louis, well, the crusade utterly failed. His Half of his army was destroyed, he was captured and later ransomed, he spent a few more years in the Holy Land kind of donating his own troops and money to the cause, then he jumped aboard the Eighth Crusade, and then he died before anything could happen, so that's pretty much it for him. And his life and his whole story is pretty interesting, but anyway, back to the Mongols. So while Queen Hamish is doing her things, many of the Mongols are starting to get fed up with her rule. She wasn't really up to the task, and she was also a Nestorian Christian, which meant, again, that there was this sort of religious divide between her and the majority of Mongols who were pagan. But fed up the most with this entire situation was that guy Batu, or Batu, who keeps on coming up. And Batu was done with the Ogadai family's monopoly of the throne. He was sick of their cons, he was sick of their queens, and it was time for a new family to take over. So let's jump back to the big four families stemming from Genghis's four favorite sons. The Jochi family, or the Joch family, is led by Batu, and he wants his family to be in control. Makes sense. The Jagatai family, they don't really have a great candidate for the throne, so they throw their support behind the Ogadai family, and the Ogadai family, of course, is the one in control of the throne. Finally, the fourth family, the family of Tolui, or he's also called Tolo sometimes, they were fed up with how things were being run. Now, Tolui, or Tolo, was dead, and his wife, the widow Sorgatani, was now the leader of his family. And she was politically savvy and smart, and she wanted her family to take the throne. In particular, she wanted her son Monk to be the next great Khan. He's also sometimes called Monkey or Monk, but I'm going to stick with Monk. Again, there are always 16 different ways how to say their name, and every historian, it's just kind of the rule of Timurid and Mongol history. If you're a new historian, you have to pronounce and spell their name differently than any other historian has ever done it. It's so annoying. Anyway, so Sorgatani approaches Batu with a proposal of an alliance between their families, putting their strength behind their ca- this new candidate, Monk. And Batu and his family agree to do this proposal because, hey, at least we're freaking done with the Ogadai family in control, and the Jochi family will be rewarded for its loyalty quite handsomely for sure, so it works out for both of our families to get behind Monk. So Batu of the Joch or Jochi family organizes a quarrel tie to elect the new Great Khan, who the Jochi and the Tolui families want Monk to be. But there's a problem with this plan. First of all, hosting this quarrel tie is essentially treason. Because remember that Guyuk, while Great Khan, had declared from then on only his descendants could be Great Khan. And secondly, the Ogadai family is still in control of the empire with their queen regent, Queen Hamish, and they have the support of the Shagatai family as well. And if you're confused about how all of these family trees work and alliances, I totally get it. It's super confusing, but I'll do my best to explain it, and I will include a few family trees and explanations in the show notes. So if you're lost, just check out the show notes, and hopefully that'll kind of explain things a little bit better. So, Batu holds the curl tie anyway, which is essentially a coup in everything but name. And understandably, the Ogadai and Jagatai families, or at least most of them, refuse to attend the curl tie, because they see it as not a real curl tie. Well, it was real enough, because the Jochi and Tolui families elect Monk as the fourth great Khan of the Mongol, Mongol Empire on July 1st, 1251. So now you have two rulers of the empire both claiming to be the ruler. You have Queen Regent Hamish of the Ogadai family claiming that her family is the only family that can be Great Khan. And then you have Monk who claims he's been rightfully elected at the Curl Tie. Well, 
Monk, again, was your picture-perfect Mongol leader. Warrior, politician, administrator, all that good stuff. And the people knew his name and respected him for that. On the other hand, Queen Hamisha's sons were very young, inexperienced, and completely unknown. So I, I think you know where this is going. Most of the empire decides to support Monk. He was elected at the Kuril Tai, he looks like a great leader, but Queen Hamish is having none of it. So she organized a coup of her own, a coup against the coup. So she starts plotting with her sons and her supporters. We're going to gather an army. We're going to take back the throne. We're going to win the throne for the family of Ogadai. And the entire plot is found out pretty much right away. Monk announces that this is treason. So he has Queen Hamish stripped of her power, tortured, sewn into a sack, and thrown into a river. As for her sons, they were either banished or executed. Monk's younger brother, some nobody named Kublai, tries to protect one of these sons from his brother's wrath, but eventually Monk decides to kill that son as well, and thus ends Ogadai's family control over the Great Khan position. Monk of the family of Tolui was now the sole ruler, the fourth Great Khan of the Mongol Empire. So, well, let's talk about him for a little bit. And he, he really does deserve his own episode, kind of how we did things with Ogadai. But at some point, we really do need to finish up with the Mongols so that we can get to Timur. So here, here's a brief summary. The first thing that Monk did as Great Khan, as can be expected, was to carry out a purge of all the important government positions. Anybody of the Shagatai or Ogadai families that had been against him, well, they're out. Fired, banished, arrested, executed, killed, doesn't matter, they're out. And in their place, we're going to put some loyal members of the Jochi or Tolui families. So it was a bloody decision, but nevertheless, a good decision for Monk to make in order to really kind of build the foundation of his power as the great Khan of the Mongol Empire. Monk is ready to restore his empire to a greatness worthy of his grandfather Genghis, and he kicks the Mongol machine back into action. The Yasa, or Code of Laws, is revitalized, taxes are collected, trade is bolstered, and all talk of dissent is crushed. And the Empire, it's going places, man. And Monk was really the leader the Mongols needed at this point in time. He was energetic, stern, but fair, hated the life of luxury. In fact, the only hobby he had was hunting. He knew how to appoint and who to appoint to leadership. At one point early on in his reign, his younger brother Kublai just goes a little too far, you know, practicing his own leadership and whatnot. But Monk sees this, summons Kublai to him directly, and the two brothers, for once in Mongol history, two Mongol brothers actually reconcile and move on. Which again, Monk, it shows that Monk was on top of things, even if it was keeping his own brothers in line. And of course, like any good Mongol great Khan, Monk is all about conquest. But unlike Guyuk, Monk doesn't really have his eyes set on Europe so much. No, he's looking at China and the Middle East. So Monk sends his brother Hulagu to continue the conquest in the Middle East. Meanwhile, Monk and his brother Kublai, they're going to lead the conquest of China. Kind of a two-pronged attack. Again, at this point, the Mongols don't care about opening multiple fronts of warfare up. They can do it, so why not do it? Now, if you'll remember, the Mongols have been warring with the Song Dynasty of China, like, forever, for decades at this point. And Monk is done with that, so he focuses most of the Empire's attention on finishing off the Song. To do this, though, he first conquers the Dali Kingdom in southern China, and then after some bitter jungle fighting, he subdues the people of Vietnam, and then went on to subjugate the Kingdom of Tibet. No, these people aren't the Song, but now the Mongols can attack the Song simultaneously from the north, the west, and the south. And so they do. And at first this is met with great success, but as the Mongols get further and further into Song territory, the terrain becomes more filled with jungle, which means the Mongol horsemen are completely unable to function the way they normally do, that is, on horseback. As such, the campaign slows down as Monk is forced to begin learning Chinese tactics and gathering Chinese troops so that he can fight the Chinese basically how the Chinese would do it. He's fighting fire with fire or fighting China with China. And Monk does this, but really the guy he puts in charge of this, this new way of thinking, you know, learning how the Chinese fight, learning how we can defeat the Chinese with Chinese tactics, well, the person he puts in charge is his little brother Kublai. And Kublai just eats the Chinese culture up. He loves it. He loves the art. He loves the way of governing. He loves the way of fighting. He's really just diving into Chinese culture. And that will come back later on down the line when we get to Kublai. 
Anyway, meanwhile in the West, Monk's brother Hulagu is leading the Mongolian invasion of the Middle East. Now, jumping back in time just for a minute, back in the year 1251 when Monk was elected, some diplomats from the Abbasid Caliphate had attended, seeking to find some sort of peaceful arrangement between the Abbasids and the Mongols. Now, who were the Abbasids? Well, if you know your Islamic history, then you know that much of the political history from the Prophet Muhammad to arguably 1918 or so was passed through the caliphates, political empires or entities that were also theoretically the head of the Islamic faith. Now I say theoretically because this gets complicated just immediately, as not all Muslims recognized the caliphates and some even fought against them, but theoretically the caliphates were at least the standard bearer of the Islamic world. And quite often this meant that the various caliphates would achieve immense amounts of power, wealth, influence, and learning. The Abbasid Caliphate was the third of such caliphates, and at its height, the Abbasids controlled an empire larger than the Roman Empire at, the, at the, its height. But as centuries progressed, and due to things like wars with rivals, inept leaders, and your normal political problems like that, the Abbasid Caliphate had shrunk in power immensely. Instead of being a global empire, which they once were, they were now, at the time of Monk Khan, focused primarily in the city of Baghdad and the surrounding regions of what we would today call central Iraq and parts of Kuwait. Now I have to pause here because I said the word, I said Baghdad. Okay, so a few weeks ago I was telling one of my family members about the history of Baghdad, a very rough history, and no matter what I said, all that this individual could think of was how Baghdad looks today on the screens of CNN and Fox News and things like that. Baghdad is nothing but a pile of rubble and we took it over so that we could kick out Saddam Hussein and it's always been this way. Now, I'm guessing you probably don't view Baghdad this way, but if you do, throw that description away forever. Because for centuries, the city of Baghdad was one of the most important cities in the world, if not THE important city in the world. This was a city that connected the east with the west, the north with the south. It was the center of learning. And nowhere were people more academically, scientifically, technologically advanced than Baghdad. Maybe at certain times this fluctuated, but by and large, the city of Baghdad under the Abbasid Caliphate was the center of the learned world. This period is usually referred to as the Islamic Golden Age, and it's as important to the story of humanity as the Renaissance, or things like that, like the scientific revolutions. Well, the Islamic Golden Age is just as important as them. And this was the city of Baghdad on the advent of Hulagu and the Mongols. Anyway, the Abbasids had sent diplomats to Monk asking for some sort of arrangement, but no peaceful agreement was made. And Monk told his brother Hulagu to approach Baghdad and demand surrender. And should the caliph, that is the ruler of the caliphate, should he not meet you in person, then flatten the city and kill everybody inside it. Anyway, so Hulagu begins to march towards Baghdad. On his way though, he is forced to deal with another political entity first, and this group of people were known as the Assassins, or the Hashishin, or the Hashishim, you'll see all sorts of words, but the history of the Assassins is utterly fascinating. They were an Islamic Shiite Ismaili religious sect and political system, with the king of the assassins using fear, threats, and most of all, assassins, to achieve his political aims instead of your traditional methods like armies and war. And for a few centuries, these assassins became really the man behind the curtain sort of political entity in the Middle East. And if anybody died from mysterious circumstances in this time period in this region, chances were that it was the assassins. Well, the Mongols needed to wipe them out, and there are a few ther theories as to why this is. It's very possible that hundreds of these assassins had attempted to kill Monk Khan, or it could be because of the logical reason that Hulagu simply didn't want to be flanked while marching on Baghdad. Either way, the Mongols started their new advance into the Middle East by taking out the assassins. Now, if you want to know more about who the assassins were, and I can't blame you, they're fascinating, then I highly recommend the podcast Our Fake History, where the host Seb 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 Sebastian, Seb Sebastian, hope he doesn't hear this, he does a great job sort of breaking down their history and the myths that surround them. It's a great episode and a great show. Our Fake History is probably in my top three favorite podcasts, even though I just kind of insulted the host by not being able to say his name, but go check it out if you're interested in the assassins. Anyway, back to the Mongols, the assassins were defeated, meaning that Hulagu continued his march on Baghdad. Tragically, the Caliph of Baghdad, 
perhaps led astray by corrupt advisors, perhaps because of his own bad judgment, or perhaps, as Hulagu put it, because it was the will of God, well, the caliph refused to meet or to submit to Hulagu. So the Mongols marched on Baghdad. The Abbasids were able to achieve a victory against the Mongols, surprisingly enough, but they failed to follow up on the victory. So that Mongol contingent that was defeated, well, it was able to regroup and join with the rest of Hulagu's forces. Hulagu then laid siege to the city, eventually stormed it, and in the year 1258, Baghdad fell to the Mongols. Hundreds of thousands of people were slaughtered or enslaved, the city was burned to the ground, its treasures looted, and its, li its vast libraries and books were burned or thrown into the Tigris River. Infamously, it is said that the Tigris River ran red with blood mixed with black from the ink from all of the books. The caliph was, according to most legends, rolled into a rug and then crushed to death by the Mongol horsemen. The sack of Baghdad by the Mongols is perhaps the most infamous event of all Mongolian conquests as it brought the Islamic Golden Age to a collapse, destroyed the Third Caliphate, and wiped out one of the most important cities in the world at that time. And, sort of unfortunately, we will return to this topic when we get to Timur's attack on Baghdad. We will we'll kind of look at Hulagu's attack and Timur's attack and we'll compare the different sacks of the city. Anyway, after Baghdad, Hulagu and the Mongols continued west into Syria, capturing and sacking important cities like Aleppo, Damascus, and others, bringing most of the Middle East under Mongolian rule. Meanwhile, back in China, Monk was pushing everyone and everything he had towards the destruction of the Song once and for all. But again, the deeper the Mongols delved into the jungles of China, the more problems arose for them. They couldn't fight on horseback on the open plains as they were used to, and cholera and dysentery ran rampant through their ranks, killing thousands. Monk was advised to retreat to better land to get out of the jungle so his troops could recuperate, but Monk refused. We must destroy the Sung. We're nearly there. Well, this entire plan collapsed when on August 11th, 1259, Monk, the fourth Khan of the Mongolian Empire, died. As you've probably come to expect, we're not entirely sure how he died. Most sources say he died of either cholera or dysentery, but he may have been killed in combat, and then the sickness was just used as a way to keep morale up instead of admitting that the Sung had actually killed the Khan. Either way, the Great Khan was dead, and this marks two important things in the overall history of the Mongols. First of all, under Monk, the Mongol Empire had reached its greatest extent ever. I will put a map in the show notes, but if you've never seen a map of the Mongol Empire at its greatest extent, go check it out. It is just astounding how large this empire was. Stretching from the Baltic Sea to the borders of Egypt to Vietnam to Korea, it's absolutely insane. The Mongol Empire under Monk is the second largest empire ever created by humans, and it's the largest continuous empire that's ever been forged. But secondly, this also marks the end of a united Mongol Empire, because with the death of Monk, the empire was finally thrown into that inevitable civil war that we've, you know, been building up to for years now. Now, the empire would sort of be reunited later on down the road, which we'll get to, but this is really only in name, and it wouldn't last long anyway, but for all intents and purposes, this is really the end of the united Mongolian Empire. So that about wraps it up for the third episode of the Timur Podcast. Thank you again for listening. I really do appreciate it. It means so much that my hobby of rambling on actually does help some people. If you do enjoy the show, then the best way to really help me out is to tell your friends, tell your enemies. I almost knocked over something. Yeah, anyway, tell your friends, tell your enemies. Um, that's probably bad advice, actually. But spread the word. And also, if you feel it in your heart... Leaving me a rating, a review on whatever podcast listening medium you use, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, whatever you use, leaving a review really helps me out. All feedback, public or private, positive or negative, is much appreciated. I, again, I'm kind of new to this whole podcast production thing. I'm learning as I go, I'm making a lot of mistakes, so any feedback, I really appreciate. Speaking of feedback, if you want to reach out to me, find the show notes, or find other places to listen, then check out the podcast website at timmerpodcast.com. You can also follow the podcast on Twitter at Podcast Timmer or on Facebook at TimmerPod, or you can email me at timmerpodcast at gmail.com. Again, there's a whole host of ways to reach out to me. Next week, we're going to look at the ensuing civil war and following split of the Mongol Empire. 
and from there we'll end up pretty close to Timmer. So like I said last week, we'll be getting to Timmer very soon, so hang in there. I know we all want to get to Timmer. That's what I named my podcast, that's what it says on the cover, and yet here I am rambling about the Mongols. Just ugh, get to Timmer already. Well, he'll be here by the end of the year. Again, thank you for listening. I will see you next week right here on the Timmer Podcast. <laughs>